And I am so glad that you have shown up in this building tonight to hear a word from God. And before you get seated, we are going to dive right in. I want to speak to you tonight from Proverbs 23. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? And it goes on, but we're going to stop right there. And I want to pray. Thank you, God, for bringing us together this night, God. Thank you for being who you are, the most high, magnified, glorious King. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are so grateful for this opportunity to commune with you, to hear from you, to believe in you, oh God. I thank you that you have placed a word on the inside of me, God, and that you and only you know how to deliver it to all of the people you have called to hear it, Father. I die to self, remove all of me from this night, God, and let yourself stand firm and tall in me, O oh God. Let your Holy Spirit fill me and be heard, heard by every ear in this home, O oh God. We love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, 1LA family. <laughs> I am so grateful to be speaking to you all tonight, and I am so grateful to our pastors, Pastor Tere Roberts and Pastor Sarah Jakes Roberts. Y'all need to stand up again. The relationship they bring us into Christ in this house changes lives it's changed my life and i know it's changing yours i am so grateful for their obedience and so grateful that they have created this house for us to learn about and become more intimate with our savior in i'm grateful for the other pastors they've anointed who are here tonight and to my husband <laughs> and my whole family y'all i have a family in part because of my relationship with christ which is amazing um I want to give a full disclaimer, I'm very transparent. Um, tonight is going to be a rough ride. I have not been sent here with a Christmas gift to proclaim for y'all. Um, God wants to talk with us about exactly what we were just singing about, the battle. And the great news is that he won the battle for us, that it's fixed. The challenge <laughs> I want to talk about with you all tonight is that he needs us to grow up in him a little bit more. And that means that we need to be prepared to not only battle and worship and war and this is how I fight my battles, but to take a punch. We need to be prepared to deal with pain when it comes. We need to be honest with ourselves about what we're doing that inflicts pain on us. And we need to develop a way to respond to pain so that when that comes, because the word has said it, we've all experienced it, God has made it very clear that our lives, throughout our lives, we will be facing and confronting pain. He doesn't want this to level us. And so that proverb, it's funny, I, I mentioned I have two kids. Um, the title of that proverb is, listen to your father. <laughs> Which makes me chuckle because we have a four-year-old and half of what we say to him all the time is listen, listen, listen to your father, listen, listen, listen. And so if you read all of Proverbs 23, it is encouraging correction and receiving and hearing from God about a very difficult area, which is how we consume things, how we overeat, how we overwork how we get seduced by things, how we drink too much, and what kind of pain that causes us. This is not, not pretty stuff, guys. And what I want to highlight about that is simply that there are some wounds. Wounds without cause was the last line of that scripture that we looked at. And he wants us to be aware of where we're causing pain to ourselves. First of all, just die to that. Um, we're in a place right now, I think, where pain has been uh, filled with this negative kind of expectation that pain alone is a problem, that there's guilt and shame attached to it. You must have done something wrong. You must not have been praying right. You must not have known the Lord well enough. There's all of these things that make pain something that has too much attached to us for it. And I want to be really clear with you, it's just an alert. It's just like an alert on your phone that says, ping, hey, you got a notification from Facebook. 
<laughs> Ping, hey, you got a phone message from your husband. Ping, hey, you got an Instagram direct message from that guy you had a crush on. Whatever the message is, it's just an alert. It in and of itself um, is not negative, but the pain that's attached to it is alerting us to the fact that there is something wrong. And when we're sidetracked by the fact that we experience the pain and get lost in that and lay down and wallow in it, we can't strategically respond and move forward in the way that God calls us to. And so we're going to learn how to take a punch tonight. Um, I mentioned that we're designed, that this walk with God is designed for us to face pain. And there's a few ways that that happens. One, and my husband actually talked about this on Sunday. If you didn't watch the message, uh, go back and review them. <laughs> He spoke uh, really aggressively about what sacrifice means. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he stood up here and was like, it means it has to die, die, die. It was, it was really, really, you know, clear about the fact that sacrifice doesn't just mean that you're inconvenienced by something. It means that you are putting something to death completely. That means that you are constantly, as a believer, asked to lose things. To, to get comfortable and to process loss. If you're not just setting something aside and then coming back to it, that means that when you move away from a relationship, when you move away from a habit, when you move away from a lifestyle, things that you used to consume, that thing is dead to you now and you have to grieve it. There is sadness attached to that, there is pain and mourning attached to that, and all too often, we rely on the platitude, the amazing scriptures, let me not call them platitudes, the amazing scriptures of, I can do all things through Christ and who strengthens me, and the joy of the Lord is my strength, and we just sort of push on past those things, but if we don't process them, they show up in other ways. And so that proverb talked about some of the kind of obvious ways that we have habits that can inflict pain. But I wanna dig a little deeper beyond that and look at what happens when the way we're processing pain brings us more pain. And I wanna talk about how we can begin to process pain in a way that is healthy. So this is what mind renewal is about. We all have patterns, I have patterns. I certainly grew up in the kind of household where if I was in pain, it was like, watch a cartoon, eat some ice cream, eat your feelings, like whatever the <laughs> distraction was, that was the way through. And I had like six brothers and sisters, so we just had to survive sometimes. You know, we didn't have time to dig into psychotherapy 101 and get all deep in the emotional intelligence with the three-year-olds, like that was not our, our portion at the time. Okay, so I've survived, I've thrived, but uh, as an example of what can happen when your pain management process um, can make things worse for you, I want to tell you a little story. Uh, a few years back, I woke up, I mean, charged for the day. I was ready to face the day, excited, high spirits, joy filled. I had this day on lock. Right? I was ready to go. And I felt a little twinge in my shoulder, like maybe a two on the pain scale of one to ten. A little twinge. And I was so confident and so excited to face the day. I was like, you know, I know exactly what to do about this. It's a muscle. It's clearly sore. Heat makes my muscles feel better. Like, we love hot tubs. This is great. And massages make my muscles feel better. This is great. I was like, I'm going to do a double whammy. I'm going to knock this thing out, take a hot shower do some massage, you know, work the kinks out, it'll be great. This was my plan. And I get in the shower and I, you know, run all the hot water out of the house, okay? This was like really, really working this out. It was not a big deal. I just knew I was going to finish, not feel any pain at all. Y'all, I wore all of the hot water out of that shower. There was none left. And within two seconds of getting out of the shower, my entire back, my entire back was covered in pain and I could not breathe, I could not move. And I learned very quickly that apparently your back is like the center of all of your muscles. So you can't do anything if your back isn't working. So I'm standing there like paralyzed and barely breathing. I managed to lay down on the floor and I cried out for my husband with this little feeble call. Help! 
tiny house, so he could totally hear me, and he came running, and God bless him, he didn't laugh at me or anything. But he sees me there on the floor, like, oh, and I was fine when I woke up. I was supercharged, so he's like, what in the world is happening here? So he, he doesn't make fun of me, but he does help me into the bed, and he's smart and reasonable, and he put something together that I had failed to notice, which is that I am not a doctor, I am not a nurse, I am not a physical therapist. I'm not even a massage therapist, okay? So I know very little about muscles and how they work. But instead, I figured I got this. I have a plan, right? This is where it leaves me, paralyzed on the floor, in the bed now, thanks to his help. So he recognized that in an instant, and he got on the Googleologist. The Googleologist is your search engine. It's very helpful, unless you're a hypochondriac like I used to be, it will tell you terrible things about your sickness. So he searches this and finds out that lo and behold, <laughs> if you have a muscle injury, not a little bit of soreness, but an injury, the very worst thing you can do for it is what? See, you guys knew this. Y'all let me tell this whole story. I did not know this. So. The worst things are heat and massage. This was exactly what I jumped into. So he gets ice for me, and I get a muscle relaxer. We're waiting for this to heal. Nothing's changing. We finally go to the ER. I ended up passing out from shock in the emergency room and getting a shot in my butt. And you know it's bad when they just go straight for the biggest muscle in your body, like, we need to knock this out. So this was, I mean, one morning, you know, I had to go to work that day, that didn't happen. But the way I woke up to face this, with confident and assurance, but ignorant, I followed my little system for how I was gonna deal with this pain, and the pain turned into something radically different, something dramatically different that actually paralyzed and stopped me completely. And that's what I wanna unpack here is, there are ways of dealing with pain that we've grown up with in my case, I mentioned it was mostly avoidant. And when we don't process pain the right way, it metastasizes. And when, when pain metastasizes, that's where it literally starts in one part of your body and it ends up somewhere else. And that happens to us not only physically, but emotionally as well. This is what happens when we grow up and our parents are not there enough for us and now in later years we have a hard time connecting with our wife or we get rejected in our childhood and now we have a hard time planning and preparing and doing things that require commitment because we're afraid we'll set ourselves out there and make ourselves vulnerable and not be able to face the pain that might come on the other side of it. So I want us to look at two things one is this unhealthy way of processing pain and just keep that image in your mind if you need to <laughs> don't end up in the er like i did <laughs> this is the the wrong way to process pain um is called metastasis where the development of pain in different parts of your being be are developed there because of pain from another part of your being that's the unhealthy way the healthy way is metabolism and this is the mental process in living things that changes pain into fuel for growth. Fuel for growth. Now, can you imagine what would happen if every time you knew you were going to face physical pain or emotional pain, you had a system in place that was going to allow you to process it for something that builds you, for something that teaches you more about the strategy of how the kingdom of God is advanced, something that increases your capacity for compassion, something that increases your capacity for wisdom and understanding. There are ways to grow in pain, but we have to be willing to look at it the right way. And what our metabolism approach is, and I say metabolism because, again, doing away with any of the negative, you know, things that are attached to pain, uh, this is a lot like food. That proverb that highlights how the things you consume can hurt you. God allows us to go through things in life because he's feeding us. He is filling us up with life experience and wisdom and maturity, and we need to learn how to eat it. I've got a four month old, and the first thing I learned when I brought her home was that her stomach wasn't ready to eat. 
<laughs> and so I would nurse her, and it's a perfect food, but she had to learn how to digest it. She had to make sure that her body was getting adjusted and acclimated to it, and we have to do that with our life experiences. We've got to make sure that what we're ingesting can be metabolized. There are some things we're eating that are like bones. A toxic relationship is like consuming bones and expecting your body to metabolize that thing. It will not happen. Consuming things that are not full of life for you won't be metabolized properly. And eventually, he can work it all together for your good. But how many of us want to be charging ahead, running ahead towards this race instead of running around, picking up and cleaning up all of the messes we're making when he's given us a plan. He's given us a plan. And so when we learn how to metabolize pain, this is, it may seem a little clinical. I know that when we're grieving a loved one, and it's the holiday season, so all of these memories become very present. All of the rifts in our family become very present. The, the state of our nation can add extra pressure and stress and pain. All of these things can compound and make us you know, feel extra stress and pain, but we have to be able to take a step back and say, who am I? Reminding ourselves that we are a child of God, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that he had a plan for us before he formed us in our mother's womb. That focus, that clarity allows us to say, well then, who am I in this? If this person passed away in my life, who am I in this? Am I supposed to be grieving on the floor and weeping for a year? Or am I supposed to be digging into the word and learning how David mourned and how he turned that into a kingdom for God? How am I supposed to be processing this thing, God? And when we bring that to him, when we focus on who we are, and when we're strategic about allowing him to fill our mind with the thoughts for how, how we should process this pain, he will bring clarity to it. He will allow us to experience it. So God is not an avoidant God. <laughs> he won't let you run from anything. And I think I mentioned in the example I gave, the way I was raised and the things that I internalized was do the things that are comfortable for me. Do the things that feel good. Do the things that bring pleasure. And I'm glad that our church knows better than that. <laughs> our church has come to the place where we embrace the reality that you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable, which is a huge step. But that's part of what it means when you have to learn how to process pain is that you will need to experience it. That doesn't have to uh, take you by force. It doesn't have to be something where you pretend it doesn't exist and you go about your day suppressing the feeling or not thinking about it. You can literally set a date with yourself, set some time to move aside everything in your life and focus on this thing and commune with God and say, who am I? Remind me of who I am. Remind me of what you've placed me on this planet to do and show me what I need to learn from this God. Talk through everything that you're experiencing in that moment. Because when it's not released to him, we can't grow more intimate with him. Yeah. See, he knows all of us. He knows everything that we're experiencing in a given moment. And he wants to be closer to us, but he's healthy. <laughs> and so he won't ever force intimacy. He's not going to call you up and say, hey, I know that you were dealing with this blah, blah, blah thing, and so I need you to tell me about it because, girl, last time I went through that, it was crazy, and oh my gosh, I need to talk with you about it. Matter of fact, this other... That's not... That is not our Lord, thank goodness. He'll sit there, and he'll watch. And he'll watch you even more vigilantly because when we're in pain, that's when we're inclined to not do the right thing. That's when we're inclined to do anything out of desperation, to heal ourselves or numb ourselves or run from whatever that pain is. And so he's watching us carefully and he's ready to jump in as soon as we're re willing to reveal what's going on to him. But we have to bring it to him first. And what can happen if we don't do that, if we develop a pattern of withholding things from God and we're experiencing pain, you can actually begin to develop resentment for him. Because how could a God 
who has placed you on this planet and controls all things and knows all things allow me to suffer? How could he allow me to sit in this and not show me a way out? How could he bring me to the brink of suicide and not scoop me up and rescue me? Why would you do this to me, God? And if we're not clear on it, we may, we may point that resentment at something that's more handy, something that's closer or easier to see, like a loved one or like ourselves. And so we end up in this tug of war, this wrestling match that we were never meant to have with things that are meant to grow us, but instead are destroying us and our relationships that we're supposed to draw strength from. And so I want us to get comfortable with facing this thing, facing it with him. You may need help. Don't, you know, I, I tell you that story about my <laughs> emergency room trip because it was a cautionary tale, a funny cautionary tale, but a cautionary tale. Nonetheless, I didn't go to a doctor first. And we may need to get folks in our, our lives that can help us sort through these things because we can't do it on our own. And it's not always your best friend who's qualified to deal with this. It's not always the Instagram, you know, post that's qualified to tell you in a few bullet points how you should manage your mental health issues. <laughs> it's not even just your pastor on a Thursday night or on a Sunday. It has to be intensely focused. You'll need to study this thing and research it and make sure that you're devoting time to unpacking it so that you can connect with God on it and allow him to reveal to you how it's going to build you. Because when we allow this to build us, we get strengthened. The reason that this is such an important message for this time and season is that God wants his glory to be revealed in us. All of creation is eagerly awaiting the revealing of its sons and daughters. And here's the challenge. His glory is revealed in direct proportion to how well we manage pain. The last thing that Christ did before he passed away was experience the most intense pain of a lifetime. And we have to be able to manage that as well. And when he was experiencing it, he didn't say, like I might have, no, I got a plan for that. Let me go and exacerbate the pain over here and do something and just not face up to whatever you're calling me to do. No, he said, forgive me, forgive them their sins, God. Forgive, 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 forgive. He never lost sight of who he was. And he never lost sight of how he was called to purpose. And that's ultimately the greatest tool that we have is as we're working through this pain, God will show you exactly what you need to do and how you need to receive from it. But I'll give you a spoiler alert. It'll involve a lot of forgiveness. Forgiving God, forgiving yourself, because the enemy will lie to you and tell you it's your fault. That it's your fault you're still hurt about being abused when you were a child. That it's your fault you're still hurt about the way that your children speak to you. That it's your fault you didn't get that audition. It's always, always, always about blame and shame. And God has called us to fullness. He has called us to wholeness. He knows that we are already loved and we are already fully known and we are love. And so that completion is at war with these daily lies that are saying something else. And when we're hurting and we get desperate, that's when we're weakest, that's when we're most vulnerable, and while we know that Christ strengthens us most in that moment, it's also when we're most vulnerable to being used by the other side. And what's at stake here, when his glory on, is on the line, is that we be used for the other side that we start arguing, we start holding on to unforgiveness, we grow bitter. These are things that war against who God has called us to be. God is not simply the God of blessings and bliss, and he did this thing for me, and I praise him because he did a great thing in my life. Well, the word reminds us that's not that impressive. 
Loving someone who loves you is not hard. But praising a God who is allowing you to experience some suffering while you're in the middle of the pain, hallelujah, God, hallelujah, hallelujah. You are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. This may be my pain for a moment, but this season will not last. And you remain who I center my eyes and my faith on when you can praise him in every season. That's the kind of relationship that is so nuanced and intimate, so deep and full and perfected. It's incredibly attractive. And that is how his gospel is spread, is not simply by saying who he is, but by living who he is when it's the hardest, not when it's the easiest. And while we're confronting pain in all these different areas of our lives, this is what he wants us to know, is that we can slow down, we can slow down and focus on him and commune with him and learn about what this really means for us. There's a lot at stake here. Um, And while the pressure is off, because as I started out saying, this is a fixed fight, (laughs) he won this fight before we ever showed up, The pressure is off, but he does love us and he wants to keep us from harm. And so we have to be mindful of avoiding these self-inflicted wounds, the things, the habits that we're doing that are causing pain that's just not our portion, and then the ways that we're processing pain that are causing more pain. Um, There's a, a clarity that I wanna bring to the household tonight about what the battlefield looks like. We, you know, I've mentioned war with our worship and we're familiar with warring with our prayer. But in this season, God is calling us to war just by showing up, just by stepping into what he has called us to do. It's not enough to just intercede in this season, and it's not enough to worship quietly from your corner. When you're showing up for a boxing match that was rigged, that people have bet millions of dollars on, best believe you gotta step into that ring. And the fight is rigged, we don't have to worry about that, but you can't sit in the corner. You've gotta come out and step forward and get close enough to that opponent that you can actually land a punch. And they might not fall at the first swing, but you're gonna swing again because you know at some point, this guy's gonna take the floor. He's gonna hit the mat because God paid for the outcome of the fight. It's won already. But we have to stand up and confront and face these things. And the, the great news, the great news is there's nothing to be afraid of. We know he defeated death and we know how to handle pain. So no matter what you throw at us, we can't be taken out. All we have to do is step forward and swing. <laughs> you don't even necessarily have to land a punch in a fixed fight. <laughs> As long as it looks good, (laughs) you're going to get the outcome you paid for, but I'll tell you what else, and I swear I'm not a gambler, but (laughs) the longer that fight goes, the better it looks, the better the odds are, and the higher the stakes go, and the more people begin to bet against you, because you might look like the underdog, but you know what the outcome is going to be. So we have to show up. We have to show up and be confrontational with God, be confrontational with our feelings, and don't get caught in the lie that it'll take you out. You survived the last pain you dealt with. If you're hearing this word, you've survived it, and that means there is a promise over your life still. Your past pain is not your threshold. You can bear more, and God only knows what that is and what that looks like. (laughs) 
I thought maybe I could avoid the last thing God was putting on my heart to do, but we're going to be what? Confrontational. <laughs> so, family, I want us to face this together. Um, one of the most important things about metabolizing pain, about processing it in a healthy way, is the connection that I described, where you bring this to God and you explain exactly what's going on, and he is a good and loving father, and he will take you in his arms and soothe and comfort you through it and clarify you and admonish you <laughs> if you need to be. Um, but he's got you. You're safe in his arms. And there are some things that we need to confess. There are some things that we need to pray out and speak about, and I encourage you in your lives as you're moving through this process, find people who are safe to do this with. You may need to go to a Woman of Worth event and, and make some friends there. Our church has an amazing women's ministry. You may need to go to 5,000 Kings and meet someone there. You may need to call a professional, you may need to call on one of the pastors for help, but there need to be safe people who you can reach out to because God's relationship with us is not just vertical, it is also magnified in the horizontal. And so we need to be connected to people through this. And what I want us to do right now is a prayer to help us face some of these things. And I will guide you through it. I want everyone to stand if you can and open your arms to receive if you're able. And as we assume the posture of prayer, I'll ask you to repeat after me. Lord, help me to forgive my father. Help me to forgive my mother. Help me to forgive my pastors. Help me to forgive myself. Help me to forgive you, God. Help me to forgive everyone I have ever loved. Help me to face myself. Show me who I have been. And show me who I am. I surrender my pain to you. I can't do it on my own. I need you. I thank you for your help. I thank you for your love. I receive it. I thank you for your word. It was for me. I embrace it. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for making him who had no sin, all of mine, all of my weakness, all of my shortcomings, all of my failure, all of my limitations, all of my pain, you placed in his body, nailed it to the cross, and put it to death. And just like Jesus was raised up, free and victorious, because I am in him, I am raised up too. Victory is, Victory is mine. The enemy is under my feet. Is under my Grace, is Grace is on my life. And I cannot be stopped. And, I cannot be stopped. And, therefore I will not stop. and therefore I will not stop. I'm running on to you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, you all should know, I used to be an atheist. Ten years ago, I didn't believe in God. And I walked into this house, and I met him. And he saw fit to use me. And if there is anyone here whose first encounter with our Lord was tonight. I just want to honor that and ask you either to raise your hand or to come forward to the altar, to step forward, to get out of the corner of the ring and come forward to this altar.
If there is anyone who is facing pain in their life that needs to be processed in a healthy way and you know that there is more work to do, I want you to either raise your hand where you are or come to this altar. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you, I see you, I see you. If there is anyone who is ready to get out of the corner and fight some things going into the new year, meet me at this altar. And everyone in this house, pray where you are in the spirit for your brothers and sisters, that they be lifted up, that they find the right path, that they know the ways of God. Pray that their relationships are sound and safe and keep your community covered. We're a community here, we're a family here. And right now and for the rest of your life, I want you to continue in prayer for the church, for the body of Christ, wherever you are and wherever you find yourself. Father, tonight we thank you that you have brought us to your feet. We thank you, God, that we are in the throne room right now and that you, you have taken over, God, and you have spoken to us. Father, we thank you for showing us those parts of ourselves that were hard to face and for showing us what you will have us do in the coming days and months and years to heal, to help, and to move forward in your purpose and promise for our lives, O oh God. Father, I come against every lie that would try to dismantle what we've learned tonight. I thank you, O oh God, for clarity. I thank you, Father, for access to this word. I thank you, Father, that the Googleologist would give good reports. <laughs> Father, I thank you that though the burdens of the world feel heavy, your yoke is light. I thank you, God, that joy is a weapon. And I thank you, Father, that your peace is in this house. We worship you, God, and we love you, and we honor you. And in the matchless name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.